I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Steve Kuhn, a retired hedge fund manager. He spent two decades in the industry specializing in mortgage-backed securities at Cargill, Citadel, Goldman Sachs, and Pine River. In his last stint in the business until his retirement in 2016, Steve was a partner and portfolio manager at then $14 billion Pine River Capital Management and was one of the hedge fund industry's most widely known fixed income traders. Our conversation covers parlaying a passion for playing games into a two-decade Wall Street career, spending time productively when your investing specialty is out of favor, stepping away from the money game, presenting the evidence-based case for active manager alpha, talking the state of the hedge fund industry, managing his own money, engaging in philanthropy, and proposing the ideal immigration model. Please enjoy my conversation with Steve Kuhn. Steve, great to see you. Thank you, Ted. I'm honored to be here. Well, let's start with your full story. Take me back as far as you want. We'll just go from there. Sure. Grew up in Minnesota. Had two amazing parents who loved me and were kind enough to follow my obsessions, which was board games. I was obsessed with board games as a kid. Any particular games? You name it. Any strategy game, yeah. Chess, Stratego. I would uh, torture my poor parents and my poor older brother, wake them up at five o'clock in the morning to play. And uh, they were (laughs) kind enough to uh, nurture that. My parents would take me to chess tournaments and always loved playing games and decided that I wanted to kind of figure out a way to do that for a living. So I went to Harvard, studied actually game theory, part of economics at Harvard, studied under Professor Schelling, who ended up winning Nobel for his work on game theory. And then I thought, what could I do in life that's most like playing a game and uh, happens to pay you money to do it? And I thought that was Wall Street and uh, had about a 20-year Wall Street career, worked at Goldman Sachs, worked at a number of other hedge funds, worked at Citadel for a while, and then had a really nice run starting in 2008 at Pine River Capital. I was a mortgage-backed security expert for my career. And obviously, 2008, 2009 were incredible opportunities for people that knew and understood that market. There were huge mistakes in the market, huge irrationalities. And over the next six years at Pine River, we returned an average return to investors of, I think it was 34% of annualized return. Then I decided that I wanted to do some other things in life. Well, so let's go back before we, we'll go forward to the other things in life, which would be fun to talk about. What was it like at the very beginning of your career when you were learning in the mortgage market? It was great. A unique situation came to me early in my career. I was, <laughs> so I went to Harvard. You, know, you think that that's going to open every door for you. I happened to graduate in 1991. It was the biggest recession probably since it happened in 2008. It was, it was a really tough time to get a job. I had been offered a job by a firm Back in my hometown in Minneapolis, a financial firm, all lined up, all set. I was happy. And then the recession hit and they said, we have a hiring freeze. And by the way, we're actually not going to really bring you on. So my first job out of Harvard was delivering pizzas for Domino's, <laughs> which was not exactly- Wait, Now, where did you do that? I went back to go have the job. And about a week before I was about to start, they said, we're not actually going to do this, which was disappointing. <laughs> I still remember when I filled out the application for the Domino's job. They had a last place of education. I put Harvard on there. And the manager of the Domino's said, yeah, yeah, that's really funny. He thought I was being a smart aleck. Yeah, let's put it that way. Did you learn anything delivering pizzas? Well, it's funny. The next job I got was at a regional firm in Minneapolis called Piper Jaffray. And when I interviewed there, they asked me, well, why do you think you'd be good at this job? What about your previous work experience? I said, I was the best Domino's delivery driver in the whole county. <laughs> they, they, they thought that was a hilarious answer. So I guess it ended up helping me get the next job. Walk me through that sort of beginning of your career, how you learned. I love it. I love the business. I guess it feels like playing a game. And Piper Jeffrey, was a, it wasn't Goldman Sachs. It was a regional firm, a smaller firm. But that meant that I got to do a lot of things very quickly and got to see a lot of different opportunities. And it was a great place for me. 
And I was working in mortgage-backed securities there as an analyst. Just the kind of the dawn of the beginning of the MBS, the mortgage-backed security analytics market, the yield book. If you're a mortgage person from that era, this was like the first machine that could actually calculate an option-adjusted spread. This was like magic. I thought this was the coolest thing. In, uh, I think it was 1994, I was the number one user of the yield book that didn't work at Solomon Brothers. I was the number one user. And this was back when we had limited amounts of computing power. Again, revealing our age here, that that was something they had to think about. So they only allocated a certain number of calculation units to every user. And literally like three times a week, I was begging for more. I needed more calc units. So I would call the help desk. And like after about a month, everybody at the help desk knew my voice. I would say, hello, and they'd go, <laughs> calc units. You need more calc <laughs> units. I'm like, yeah, I could use some calc units. So I loved it. It was all engrossing for me. And I think that was, it was like playing a game for real money. I got to meet some really interesting characters during that time, Mike Vranos. I don't know if you know Mike, but at Ellington. I met him when he was still a kidder and saw the desk there. And they would play these games of like taking out math Olympiad problems and solving them on the desk when they were bored. Yeah, it was a unique culture, unique time. And I loved every minute of it. How long did you stay? I stayed at Piper for a few years, then I went to Cargill. And I went to Citadel, and after that, went to uh, Goldman Sachs for a little while. And then I took what was the first strange turn in my career. I took three years off from Goldman and went and lived in Beijing. Really? Yeah. Talk to me about that decision process before you went and then what that experience was like. There are times in the markets where things are incredibly interesting. There's a lot of volatility, and your ability to add value, to add alpha, is very, very high. And there are other times when markets are kind of dull. Spreads aren't moving very much. Markets are not very volatile. 2005 was the latter. I didn't feel like I could come to work and make a ton of alpha for our investors. You know, that was challenging because the years before that had been very active and very interesting. And one was able to add a lot of value. So I was a little bit down by that. It wasn't as exciting. And here was a rising China, which I was just incredibly fascinated by. And I just wanted to go. So I ended up telling Goldman, I'm going to go and do this. They ended up giving me a job in China because they didn't want me to leave. They yeah. liked me. And I did some work working for the China subsidiary of Goldman at that time. But that was not that many hours. It was you know, a few hours a week. And I had the rest of my time, I was teaching students there. And I was teaching students at Tsinghua University and Peking University, or Beida, as they say. The rough equivalent is, you know, Beida is the Harvard and Tsinghua is the MIT of China. And it's a very hierarchical college system in China. Basically, everyone in the country takes a test in their senior year. It's called the Gaokao. And the highest scores go to either Tsinghua or Beida. It's, it's clear. Like, you very rarely would a student have the score sufficient to get into those schools and not go there. They're one in one A in terms of who is the, the top school. I think there's, I, I should remember this. I think there's 38 provinces in China. And the top scorer from each province on this test, this Gaokao test, is almost like a mini celebrity. And every year, Tsinghua and Beida we get kind of fight over who got more of the 38. That's an ongoing kind of prestige battle for them. And these students are unbelievable. By the way, the Gaokao test has, if I remember, six components. There's Chinese language, Chinese history, chemistry, physics, math, and English. And if you got a high enough score in the competitive environment of the China education system to get in, your score in the English test has to be high. You, there's, there's no way. So basically every student on these campus speaks at least passable English. It's funny, though. They use the most interesting words because it's really a vocabulary test. It's not a verbal test, the Gaokao. So they have the most interesting and unique English vocabularies. So you hear words that are perfect, they're appropriate, but something nobody would actually say. And do you remember any oh, example I'll, of that? I'll, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was like reading poetry when they would write something. You're like, that is a really interesting, it makes sense, but that's, no one else would say it that way. These students were amazing. And uh, I was teaching students from both of them. I had at one point about 60 students and I was teaching them about financial markets, about what hedge funds were, about how markets work, how you can find edge, how you can find alpha. And 
a lot of those students went on to work at Wall Street firms or hedge funds. I sometimes wonder, like, what's the total amount of alpha generated by the people that I taught? <laughs> Are you still it's, in it's, touch with a lot of them? Well, one of them was a partner with me at Pine River, one of the most talented thinkers and traders I've ever met. Brilliant. It's got to be in the billions. Because, I mean, my students have worked at all the name brand hedge funds. Yeah. Students that I taught during that time have worked at all of them. That educational system, you described it as hierarchical. How did you think about the complexities of what that means for educational opportunity and the growth of the population compared to the U.S. system? So in some ways, there's things to be admired in the Chinese educational system. It is it's pretty pure. The scores are your scores. And not a lot of behind-the-scenes manipulation that will allow you to, to get a student in. You're, you're not going to have uh, – it's not going to be based on your a great athlete. It's not going to be based on whether your your parents can write a big check. It's pretty pure. So your scores are score when you take the test. But given the importance of that, you can imagine some socioeconomic stratting of yeah. who gets the right preparation to take the test. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I think that's true. There are students from all over the country at the two schools. But yeah, that's true. There's no doubt about that. What does it look like in terms of homogeneity or heterogeneity of the student population, given that there's really one factor determining where they go to school? Well, they're all brilliant. This test is a two-day long test. It makes the SAT test look very, very small compared to what they do. Students often faint going into it because it's that important. This one test in many ways determines your fate. If you get a very, very high score, you go to Tsinghua or Beida. If you get a next level score, you get to go to a not quite as prestigious university, but it's still a great university. You get a low enough score, you don't get to go to college. It is crunch time. Everything's on the line for that test. If you go to a high school in China, and I don't care whether that's in Beijing or in Shanghai or, or if it's in you know, the smallest rural village, the textbooks have pictures of the gates of Tsinghua and Beida on them. It's the equivalent of getting your son or daughter into a pro sports league getting into those schools, that's the prestige level for a parent. And you know, when we talk about you know, the future of tech supremacy or the future of economic supremacy, when you see that, you're going to see that we're going to be challenged. We're going to have to think what advantages our society have. And we have tremendous advantages that China doesn't have. But we have to maximize those advantages if we want to compete economically or strategically in the world against China. They have some advantages and we have other ones, but we have to think carefully about how to maximize ours. After you had this run at Pine River, how do you decide when to step away? There were a lot of forces that led me to that decision, but I kind of had a rising force of wanting to do good in the world. Some of this was spiritually based, and I made that clear at the time. But I, I think I'd always been a humanitarian and thinking about how can I take the skills I have and think about how can I help the most people or maximize good with that. I think that's a it's a different game. The game I played out of college was how could I make money or find something I enjoyed while doing that. And then I decided that at some point I wanted to play a different game. I wanted to play the what can I do to, to make the world better game, if you will. You mentioned a couple of different triggering events. I mean, one of them is probably some number that you felt like you were comfortable financially. Yeah. What was it that crystallized that moment or that time why not two years before or two years later? I had a bit of a spiritual awakening. It, it wasn't new that I cared about the world. I was uh, a contributor to, while at Pine River, both me and the firm were, were great supporters of Robin Hood. We were supporters of a group called Charity Water, which your listeners may know about. It's an unbelievable charity that provides clean water to people all over the world. That wasn't new, but I think it was a rising sense of, it's time to think about this more clearly. And that's what I've spent the last five years doing. And the last four months, I've got a new mission related to that, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit later. So before we turn to that, let's talk hedge funds. What's your take on hedge funds today? And it's a broad category, but have at it however you want. Sure. Well, here's one thing I say to people about the industry in general is we've had almost the perfect academically designed test, whether there's elf in the market or not. So there's ongoing debate of whether there's markets are efficient or not. That perfect test has a name. It's called Millennium. So 
Millennium is a hedge fund that hires lots of smaller groups of people to come in and manage some part of their capital. They have a large pool of capital. I think it's $35 billion, more or less. And they'll give a new manager a chance if they believe that they have potential to be someone who can make money can at Alpha and maybe start them with $100 million and see how they do. If they do well, it grows. If they do poorly, it shrinks or maybe it's taken away. It's basically a, kind of a genetic algorithm to see if there's Alpha or not. That would be the perfect experiment to see if markets are efficient or not. If that doesn't work, that's evidence that markets are pretty darn efficient. If it does work, that's pretty strong evidence that that works. So they've been doing this for, I don't even know how many years now. It's in decades, not in single digit years, with hundreds of different groups on board. And it would be impossible statistically to think that that's random at this point. Let's, let's put it that way. They continue to do well. And that's net of fees. Net of, net of a, and not small fees. Not small fees. <laughs> Mazel tov. It's good, it's good for them. <laughs> I just don't see how that's really a debate anymore. Anyone who would take a fair look at just simply their track record alone. So markets are not efficient. There's a lot of views that are negative about hedge funds. But let's think about what hedge funds in theory are trying to do. They're trying to find mistakes in markets and correct them. And I think that's actually a pro-social idea. If we only had index funds, and, and I love index funds. I think for most investors, that's a great idea. That's what most folks should do. I don't disagree with the logic of the ETF and index fund industry. I don't disagree with it at all. But in the absence of somebody looking for mistakes in markets, markets aren't efficient. And we don't allocate capital to it efficiently. We need somebody to do that. Hopefully those people do it well. That's what we should want as a society. Whether hedge funds get paid too well for that or well enough, I'll leave that debate to others. But the idea that somebody's out there doing that is a good thing. It seems to me that the search for alpha is, in some ways, it, it surprises me that there isn't more resources spent on it. Sometimes you see a New York Times article about Walmart's practices in Mexico. They were doing something... Uh, illegal in Mexico. I don't remember the exact details, but this was a few years ago. And this was a smart reporter, presumably well-paid for that industry, which is less well-paid than the, the financial industry, probably making you know, $100,000 or maybe somewhere in that range. And that day that that article came out, I think Walmart's market cap changed by something like $30 billion. Someone who's dedicated to doing research on this company can move the company's value that much and has a salary that's a very small fraction of that. Doesn't that mean that there's not enough people trying to police the markets? Well, that's a contrary view. If you, if you look at the data of sort of how many people are running around doing it. There are certainly people who do that, but relative to how big the markets are, okay, there's two pieces of evidence. One is articles like that can change market caps by that much. So in other words, no one else had done any research on, on Walmart's practices in Mexico that were dubious at that time. So that's evidence. And then the evidence that Millennium's track record. Like, obviously, if there were enough people <laughs> in some abstract economic sense, then Millennium's track record wouldn't be possible. So you were at the early stages of technology, call it, or quantitative analysis in the mortgage market. And that's clearly dramatically accelerated the last couple of years. What's your take on the importance of data and technology? Technology has a way of bifurcating things. Some people go extremely deep into something and their technology is very high. So you have the renaissances of the world who are obviously most brilliant minds on the planet. And they're playing a game at a very different level than even most hedge funds, frankly. And then I think you have other people who are literally kind of doing the boots on the ground understanding of how the companies work, not just equities, but where technology skill is not necessarily the most important thing. They can still create a lot of value in terms of their investors, but I don't think it's because they have the fastest supercomputer. So I think there are people that are going down that path, the renaissances of the world, the citadels of the world, and they can make money doing that. But I think there's still a need for people who just understand stories in the world and people. What do you think hedge funds look like five or 10 years from now? One thing that I've told people, I think it's become more difficult to launch a hedge fund now than probably ever in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. I think that means 
as of now, kind of the big market leader is in the big brands like the millenniums of the world have a pretty big edge because the, the person who wants to raise a $100 million fund has a very difficult time doing that themselves. But Millennium says, I got a check for you. And they have a pretty big edge in finding that talent. I think there would be ways you could change that and make it easier for people. Some of these would be kind of a, the idea of like a tech incubator for hedge funds. Someone that would give you advice on how to get a lawyer that can do your documents relatively cheaply because they've done it. They'll do it repeated times. Yeah. Someone that could help you with staffing of your compliance someone that could provide kind of a third-party marketing for you. I think that would be a great business. Why do you think it hasn't been done successfully? Obviously, from your history, I'm not exactly breaking 100% new ground with this idea. You have Protege Partners and, and others. Skybridge started as an incubator. My model's a little bit different in that I think I'm just kind of providing the infrastructure. I think you could have, related to that entity, you could have a group of investors that would invest in the things that this incubator founded. But I think it would be a separate. I also think that the need now is higher than even was when Skybridge is doing it. Are you doing something with this? I've talked about doing it. Again, we're going to talk later about what I'm obsessed with now. Yeah. And that obsession is kind of blocking, or at least stalled, an effort to do something with this. Yeah. If I could only think of someone that has you know, experience in this and, <laughs> and an audience that could really help make it happen, that would make it more interesting if I knew anybody like that. So if you, if you pull a thread on that a little bit further, you said earlier that it's harder to start a hedge fund than ever before. Yeah. And so sure, there are some infrastructure tools. There are yeah. some things that you could scale that one person can't. But there is a gap of capital that goes into that space, partially because there's a perception that, you know, who needs the next hedge fund? I think there's a solution to that too. I think, by the way, the biggest thing you'd be helping the new funds with is marketing and helping them tell their story. Because a new hedge fund manager, they have to have a great first year in terms of their performance, and they have to raise money. And there's only so many hours in the day. And investors want to meet the leader, whoever that is, whoever he or she is, they want to meet that person. And if that means getting on an airplane, that means you're not sitting in front of your screens that day. It doesn't work. If they could say, this is our third party marketing person and they have the right incentives and they're aligned, yeah. this goes to the secret sauce of kind of how I want this idea to work. I think that would make their chance of success in the first year go way up. And that would be a game changer. That's the essence of what really is the value add for the funds that would work with this entity. How do you manage your own capital today? It's funny. I don't look at screens basically ever. I don't watch CNBC or Bloomberg TV. I love the folks there. Sorry, I don't watch you anymore, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're still doing great work, but it's just not a part of my daily life anymore. I'm thinking about other things. So I have a couple of companies, actually, Probably 10% of my net worth is in one stock because I think it's that mispriced. A friend of mine is obsessed with it, and he has convinced me that it's expected value, probably one-fifth the true value of the company. You want to tell the story? So how does this work? Do I get sued if I... Uh, you know, no. What, do I have to have well, some, We're going to have a formal disclaimer. Uh, what Steve is about to say is not investment advice. <laughs> He's not managing money for anybody anymore except for maybe his family. So <laughs> take this with a grain of salt. But here goes the big pitch. It's a small cap. So no accusations. I own the stock. It's called Kindred Biosciences. K-I-N is the ticker. K-I-N. And they're an animal pharmaceutical company. And... Here's the general pitch for animal ph pharmaceuticals. Animal drugs are only worth one-tenth what human drugs are worth, but they cost one one-hundredth to develop. That's the math. They have a new drug out called Miritaz, which is helpful for, I know this sounds weird, cats who have lost their appetite. You wouldn't believe that that's a problem. Apparently, it's a pretty big problem. And Miritaz is a drug you can literally just kind of swab into their ears, and it fixes the problem. It's already launched. It's incredible uptake already by that drug alone, I think is worth more than the value of the company in terms of its potential to make money. And they have 20 more drugs in the pipeline, including some that are already through several stages of trials. Well-funded? More than enough funding to get cash in the bank. To me, this looks like a really cheap option struck 
below what the value of the company already is. And that seems like a good trait. It's a small company. Nobody follows it. That's why it can be- What's the market cap? 500 million. It doesn't get a lot of attention. I think the end game is some of the other drugs get developed. Miritaz continues to grow in market share and somebody buys them for more than 500 million, hopefully. You used to run like risk controlled mortgage strategies yeah. and now you have 10% of your capital. That doesn't a, make any sense. Animal. It's not logical. Yeah. It's not logical. How have you thought about the whole pie for your own capital? I've done some investing in local companies in Austin. I've also done some kind of venture capital type stuff. I actually just invested with a group called Next Gen Venture Partners, part of Brown Advisory, who I think do a great job. I've done some of my own companies, some of which I have really high hopes for. I was an early investor in a company called Vimo Education, which I think is brilliant. I hope that's going to really, really work. When I first describe it to people, they think it's idiotic. And then if I spend like three minutes explaining why it's not idiotic, they usually kind of come around. They do something called income sharing agreements. And the idea is you're selling some of your future income for money today to go to school, which sounds terrible. I know it's indentured servitude. I get how that doesn't sound great. But let's think of one use case for this. You might know about these computer coding academies, you know, Galvanize, General Assembly, et cetera. And typically it's a three month, very intensive course to learn something in computer programming where it could be how to build a website. It could be any number of things. And people typically pay anywhere from you know, twenty five dollars to $30,000. It's a three month intensive course. It's 12 hours a day, six days a week. And the pitch is you go into this with a $40,000 job and you come out with a $100,000 job. Companies are so desperately in need of various computer skills. We can train you intensely for three months and then you can have this, have this job, but it's expensive. Now, here's a pitch for one of those companies. They could say, instead of you paying $25,000, we'll take 10% of your increase in income for the next five years and it's free. So if you, in fact, go from 40000 to 100000 we'll take $6,000 a year for the next five years, and that's how we get paid. That good, seems good like model. not only is it a good model for the firms who hire Vimo because they gain market share, but it actually is opening up that opportunity to people of lesser means. I think it's democratic. It's leveling the field. If you understand what the use cases are, I think it really is great. It's great for the world. And since these companies have skin in the game, to take something from our, our friend Nassim Taleb. If they're not adding value to the students, they don't get paid. If they take a person making $40,000 a year and only make $40,000 a year after their class, they should suffer from that. That seems to be a better model yeah. for how education should work. And by the way, this isn't limited necessarily to computer training. It could be for welding. It could be for plumbing. It could be for any number of industries where it takes an investment of time and money to upgrade your skills. It doesn't just have to be limited to technology. So you've done some direct venture investments, yeah. which is not what you did in the past. You've no. done concentrated investment in small cap animal healthcare companies, which yeah. is not what you've done in the past. <laughs> also How do you think about risk today? And then I have you know, some things and very, very safe things, municipal bonds. and So they're great if they work. I spend most of my time thinking about charity and philanthropy. I'm on five different charity boards. And... If these things work out and Vimo makes me a lot of money, which I knock on wood, I'm hoping that happens, it's probably not going to change my life that much. It's great, but it means that the things I care about will benefit. So I'm taking risk in some sense for the things that I'm trying to fund. Again, that makes the game more fun for me. Yeah. It makes it more relevant. It makes it more impactful. So just before we turn to the philanthropic side, are there things that you purposely won't invest in? based on your knowledge and experience? My first reaction is no, because I feel like I'm a contrarian. And anytime you'd say, I wouldn't do this no matter what, it doesn't ever feel like the right answer. So would there be things like maybe I had a moral concern, like I wouldn't invest in something because I think that that industry or that company is doing something that I would consider. All right, so how about in today's markets? Are there areas that you purposely aren't investing in? I would say no. I generally just don't think that way. Maybe I'm uh, inspired by your uh, Annie Duke podcast. You, you basically, you, you take in as many ideas as possible and you, yeah. you try very carefully not to 
dispose of ideas or to rule out things based on abstract categories. That's what makes for a good contrarian investor is you don't do that. Do you have any investments in index fund? Yeah. Again, I think it's perfectly fair and logical thing to do. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not against index funds. By the way, even most people investing in hedge funds, the way it is now and with you know, how complicated it is in taxes and everything else, I think it's not for everybody. Another problem that I think it would be better solved is if there was a structure that people can invest in hedge funds that were more user-friendly. Right now, it isn't, and to some degree, intentionally. That's kind of the goal of the laws. But I think there are pros and cons of that. All right. So let's turn to the passion projects. You can go from the one you mentioned is the current passion or where you started, <laughs> but let's dive in. So I'm on the boards and supporters of a, of a number of different charities. I've been on the board of the Andy Roddick Foundation in Austin, Texas for the last five years. What does this foundation do? does after school and out of school time. So after school and summer activities for kids in East Austin, which is the, the area of town that's not as well off financially. And Andy and his wife, Brooklyn Decker, are awesome. The kids love them. They have after school programs, which are mostly educational, math and STEM and reading. But they also have this great summer program where the kids get like week long exposures to different sports, different ideas. They'll do chess and they'll bring in chess teachers for a week. And these kids have so much fun with it, and Andy and Brooklyn are amazing. The support in Austin for the Andy Roddick Foundation is immense. It's just been a real joy to be a part of it. The organization has grown by, I don't know, a factor of 20 or 30 in the five years that I've been on the board. I'm not at all claiming that. Coincidentally, with me being on the board and other amazing people on the board, the organization's growing. The love for it in Austin is off the charts, so that's been amazing. I am a member of a board of a charity actually based here in New York. I was became a member of the board before I left New York called the Immigrant Justice Corps. And what they do is they provide pro bono legal advice to people who have immigration challenges. And we're going to talk more about immigration because that's my passion project. But a lot of people don't know is if you come here with an immigration challenge, if you're claiming asylum or what have you, because you're not a citizen, you're not guaranteed a lawyer. There have been cases, if you watched the show last week tonight, there have been cases of four-year-olds having to represent themselves wow. in court. There's going to be a major show on, probably be out on HBO by the time we, this actually airs, called Icebox, about a young immigrant going through the legal system on his own and the craziness that that is. To me, that's not what due process is, and it's not our better selves as a country. The phrase that one judge said, this was actually aired on last week in John Oliver's show, is sometimes we are doing death penalty cases in traffic court, and that doesn't seem like that's our best selves. So this is an amazing organization. It was founded by a judge, Robert Katzman, here in New York, who saw this kind of appalling situation and tried to fix it. So super proud to be a founding board member of that organization. Actually had coffee this morning with Scott Harrison from Charity Water, and one of the great storytellers in philanthropy and with a cause that's unbelievable, providing clean water to everyone on the planet. And Scott is amazing. I'm a member of what they call The Well. It's a group of people that donate to the charity to cover all their costs of administering so that other donors who donate to Charity Water 100% goes directly to the projects. And super happy to be part of that. Last but not least, me and... Uh, the executive director of my foundation, the ASK Foundation, Diana Greenfield, have started a youth choir in Austin called the Young Voices of Austin. And we have kids from all over the city singing together. It's modeled after the Young People's Chorus of New York City, which if you have listeners in New York and you ever have a chance to go see the Young People's Chorus, you'd be a fool not to. They are unbelievable. They performed when the Pope came to the 9-11 memorial. They are off the charts life-changing to see the Young People's Chorus perform. How did you get involved? Were you a singer? Or? Well, that's funny. It happened because one of the investors in my hedge fund was on the board and said, you have to come to this gala this year. When he said that, I really want you to come to this kid's youth choir, I'm like, yeah, boy, that's the last thing I want to do on a Tuesday night when I'm working my tail off. But yeah, he's an investor. He's a friend. I said, yes. And Literally three minutes into it, I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And eventually, I was a board member of that before I lived in New York. Yeah. That's how 
inspired I was. It's that amazing. I did not want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes after being there, I was like, this is amazing. And now we're trying, with Diana's help, we're in year two. And I think Young People's Chorus just celebrated their 25th anniversary, I believe. I should know that, but I'm pretty sure that's right. We're not quite as big, or we don't quite have the same organization that they've built, but yeah, that's our goal. But it's already great. The impact we've already had on the children's lives is unbelievable. You can, again, you see it in their faces. So super happy about that. So that's some of the things I do. And then- That's the portfolio. And so now here's the concentrated position. This is the, uh, yeah, the, the kindred biosciences of my philanthropy portfolio. So I already mentioned the IJC and, and immigration and kind of my feelings on that. And immigration is a topic that not only affects my heart. When I talk about IJC, I'm mostly talking about my heart and kind of cheering for the underdog. It's kind of a recurring theme and in, in things that I support. But it also appeals to my head. The economic impact from immigration is massive. If we had a smarter immigration policy, I think we could boost our GDP by another 3% a year. So if we're at 4% GDP now, I think we can get to 7 I think we can uniquely do that in America because we have an immigration story that's a part of our past, true to our ideals. The most talented, hardworking, amazing, ambitious people in the world want to come here. We're foolish not to let them and not to embrace them, especially if they want to follow the rules, if they want to pay taxes, if they want to be law-abiding. I think we could let in amazingly talented people who are law-abiding and use some of the money that we gain from that process to actually strengthen our borders. And I think that's the compromise that's out there politically. I think there's a huge win-win policy that makes America stronger, makes our economy stronger, makes us safer, helps us compete against China when it comes to technology. And then it makes the millions of people who are here undocumented, who are just working every day and makes their life better because A, they can sleep at night. It means that they can now travel back to their home countries if there's a, a wedding or a funeral or a holiday or any other family gathering. It makes that possible. They can start paying taxes. Some of them do now, even though they're illegal, which is a, a crazy system that the IRS allows you to pay taxes even if you're undocumented. It's vastly better for the immigrants' lives. And then the final impact is the greatest anti-poverty program in the world would be increased immigration in terms of remittances. So our official aid to Honduras is something around $400 million. Remittances are five or six billion. I think in this proposal that would double again. And if we want to solve global poverty issues, immigration's the best way to do it. It's a professor at George Mason University. Well, there's a couple. There's Brian Kaplan and Alex Tabarrok who've done a lot of work on this. And you know, Tabarrok wrote that this is the greatest anti-poverty program in the world. And we do it, by the way, not at a cost to us, at negative cost. We gain from it. This is America first and the world first. It's not either or. So my passion project is me and a group of folks in Austin, some of my best friends, have formed 501c3, a C4, and a PAC around a massive immigration reform proposal that we call the IDEAL Immigration Proposal. And IDEAL stands for Immigration Designed to Enhance American Lives, the IDEAL Immigration Proposal. You can read about it on uh, idealimmigration.us, our whole policy of how it works and I'm happy to talk about the details. I don't have, we don't yeah, have to. I mean, so how does it? But you get the flavor of it, I hope. I hope yeah. Right. So what you've done so far for me is take a controversial, yeah. hotly contested topic and make it sound like, huh, that sounds like a really good solution. Yeah. So what do you do as a single retired hedge fund manager with some resources yeah. to, okay, you've created this, there's a policy, how do you make an impact? Yeah, good question. I'm trying to figure that out myself. With the help of, like I said, a great group of people in Austin, probably been at this for about four months, created a website, which is step one. I'm working with some really talented filmmakers to do a short film. And my goal is to do something 
along the lines of what Charity Water did in their video called The Spring. If you haven't seen the Charity Water video of The Spring, go watch it. If you don't cry and open your checkbook after watching that video, I'll be surprised. It's amazing. You know, that's why another reason I met with Scott Harrison this morning is like, get his advice. How do I tell this story? How do I open people's heads and hearts to this possibility? So working on the video, I've hired a lobbyist group in DC to help get me in front of people on this. I'm reaching out to all of my friends, former colleagues, and I'm basically telling them that, yeah, I'm calling it every favor. And I need to get in front of politicians. I need to get in front of thought leaders. I need to get in front of public intellectuals and make the case. So yeah, I've met with a number of politicians already. And the diversity where they are on the political spectrum is very wide. And they all like it, not just both. I've met with a number of different politicians. And they've offered me wonderful advice on who's important and who needs to be influenced. I have a strategy. There's a lot of work between now and then. And I feel like the clock is ticking. Because I think of all the years when this is possible, 2019 is the year for massive immigration reform. Let me make that case in a number of different ways. First of all, what typically happens in many presidencies, not just the Trump presidency, is the president comes in, he ran with a certain appeal to his or her base and is true to that base for the first two years and then they learn that they lost the middle in being true to their base and they lose the midterms. This is not the first time this has happened. This is a recurring pattern. Yep. Then what do you do? They do what they call in politics triangulation. You move to the middle and you move hard because you want to get reelected in two years. So if you look at a lot of the major policy changes we've had in American history, it happens in the third year of a first term of a president. And I think President Trump has already signaled, not just with words, but also with one action already, that he's willing to meet in the middle and do bipartisan approaches. He says it. I don't know a lot of people don't give a lot of credibility to the president always on things that he says, but he already signed this kind of this sentencing reform and prison reform measure, which was something that was a bipartisan goal for a long time. I don't think it was a coincidence that he signed that now. I think he is signaling that he's open to bipartisan things. We got awfully close to a pretty big immigration reform in 2013. I think the cards are in place to do it in 2019. And things like this don't happen in even numbers because of the way our elections work. When everybody's running for president in 2020, nobody steps out of line. You get things done in an odd number of years, big things. And you really get them done in the third year of a first term of a president. I won't go into more detail on why I think this is the magical year, but I do. Uh, I think that's a very logical reason. Most people I can convince in five minutes if they'll give me an airing on it. And so I saw this kind of forming a few months ago and said, 2019 is the third year term. This could be a magical time. And the impact that the ideal immigration proposal would have on America is huge. The impact on the millions of people who are here who are law abiding and working in the restaurants and the agriculture and is huge. It also offers a path for longer term visas. So it's both a short term guest worker program and a long term program altogether. It also affords asylum reform. The things that I talked about with IJC, where we have more judges, more courts, and actually hire lawyers for people. My proposal raises about $70 billion a year in, in asking employers to pay fees for these visas. For 1% of that, 700 million, probably actually less than that, but let's just say 1% of the money that this proposal itself raises. We could have a whole new court system and lawyers for everybody. That would mean like the backlog that we have now, which is measured in 300,000 cases, we could, we could catch up and everybody could get due process. So let me back up one more thing. Let me tell you about what asylum is, what our obligations are. So the US and 144 other countries signed the UN Commission on Refugees in 1951. And that happened after World War II because Jewish people who were fleeing Germany were sent back. They weren't granted asylum, and many of them ended up dying in the Holocaust. And the world said, we're not going to do that again. So the rule is that we signed on to, again, and almost every other country did, is if a person comes and they have a credible fear that if they're sent back to their country, they'll be hurt or killed, you can't send them back. 
You have to harbor them until such time that the conditions in that country changes and they would be safe to return. We agreed to that. Being true to that is supporting the rule of law. And again, in situations where we don't provide a lawyer to even very small children who don't understand the system, we are in some ways being maybe true to the letter of the law, but certainly not true to the spirit of what we signed. It doesn't cost that much money for us to be better. It costs about 1% of the money that I raised in this proposal to do it. And by the way, you get that money back because it reduces detention times. Detention is really expensive. So not only is it inhumane to detain people and separate families and all these other issues that we talk about, but it's costly. We can be better on both. And it doesn't cost that much money. This is such an easy problem to solve. It really is. And when people hear it, when they give it a fair hearing, a lot of people say, yeah, why aren't we doing that? Here's another fun argument I like to make with people. Let's imagine China could do this. They were capable of bringing 2 million minds from all over the world to come there, pay them money to do it, pay taxes in that country, and build their tech industry and build their medical industry and all the other things that we do. We would hate that. Yeah. We would say this is an existential threat to our country. We'd be up in arms. But they don't have the right culture. They don't have the right history to do that. We do. We have this amazing advantage that we're not taking advantage of. As of now, we have sometimes some of the most smartest students in the world come here to our universities. Sometimes they're given financial aid, and then they want to come and work here and pay taxes here for some period of time, either for their life, and that's almost impossible. To me, that's the opposite of logic. That doesn't really make any sense. So what do you think the bottlenecks are in adoption of this? I've always been a, just a ridiculous optimist. I think that's, and both of those words are often appropriate. I really do believe that things can change, and sometimes that proves to be, I certainly haven't been right about things I'm optimistic about before. I've been wrong. I think this can happen. I look at who the key players are and what their incentives are, and I honestly think this is a win for both sides. I mean, when I say both sides, both the Democrats and the Republicans, it's also just beyond that, it's a win for America, it's a win for the people who are here undocumented now, it's a win for people that would come in this proposal, it's a win for their home countries in that they would be, have remittances that they would be able to send back, money they'd be able to send back to these countries. I talked to Scott Harrison today, I said, I'm encouraging him to help me spread this message. So I think it's all very logical and it's difficult. How have you applied the knowledge that you gained from managing money to these challenges? It's very different. I'm learning how, how DC works a little bit. But by the way, as part of this, I'm planning to move to DC for six months starting in January. And if anybody didn't understand that I'm committed to this, the fact that I would move from Austin to DC <laughs> in January, I'm really committed to this. What I bring to this is passion. I bring some financial resources. I'm hoping other people will join me in that. I'm trying to raise money to spread this idea and make this idea go viral and tell the story more. So I bring some financial, I bring, I think I bring credibility when it comes to what I think on the economic side. But trust me, there are people who are better economists than me and more trained economists than me and who've studied immigration policy for a long time. I'd like to say that I don't know what percentage, but it would start with a 90 you know, something percent of economists that would hear this would agree that this would be hugely beneficial to our country. One phrase, professor at, at George Mason, Brian Kaplan, who says that immigration reform isn't trickle down economics, it's Niagara Falls economics. All the picky debates we have about little differences in tax laws, et cetera, they pale in comparison to getting our immigration policy right. They're small. This is big. All right, Steve, let's turn to some closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? And in your case, we'll say and philanthropy. <laughs> Anybody that knows me for the last few years would know that I have a complete addiction to the game of pickleball. For those who don't know what pickleball is, it's, a, it's the, the quote unquote, this is what the, the phrase that every pickleball player says. It's the fastest growing sport in the world or fastest growing sport in America. About 3 million players now growing at about 25% a year, which means it doubles every three years. It is, for lack of a better description, the child of tennis, ping pong, and badminton, or I sometimes describe it as miniature tennis. 
It's amazingly fun to play. It's hand-eye coordination. It's thinking. It's logic. It's almost like chess. You have to think about where to hit the ball and how you work with a partner. It's usually teams, two versus two. I told you I was on Andy Roddick's charity board. I got Andy Roddick and Andre Agassi to do a charity event playing pickleball last year at my house in Austin, raised some money. Now you're seeing a lot of former tennis players come into the sport. The sport's getting bigger. There's starting to be a little bit more money in terms of tournament winnings. We've seen several people start pickleball-themed bars, kind of the top golf of pickleball. I'm completely addicted. That's another thing that this immigration passion is kind of ruining. It's my, my pickleball game is suffering because I'm, I'm spending a lot of time doing meetings for this. I don't get the chance to play as much as I'd like. Cool. What's your biggest pet peeve? It's interesting. My biggest pet peeve is how we debate and think about things in America. And specifically, I think ideas are debated based on who has the idea or who proposed it. Again, I'm channeling Annie Duke here again. Yeah. I feel like I'm the biggest fan of the Annie Duke fan club. I've met Annie one time. She probably doesn't remember me. But I met her at a charity poker event, and I've been a fan of hers forever. I used to play poker reasonably seriously myself. So I read her book after listening to your podcast. You got me to read the book, and I've probably given it to 100 people since then. But she talks about how anti-intellectual that is and how a clear thinker separates an idea from whoever proposed it. And that's just the opposite of our political culture right now. And I think that's a loss. That doesn't allow for as clear thinking. How about on the investment side? What's your biggest investment pet peeve? When somebody intelligent says that, that financial markets are efficient and anybody who tries to tell you is that is impossible. <laughs> it's both true and not true. For most people, that's great advice just by index funds. But Specifically, when Warren Buffett kind of beats up on hedge funds. But when he beats up on hedge funds, he does it in ways that are both true and not true. And I think he knows that. And that kind of, yeah, that's a pet peeve. What reading do you almost never miss? I read a blog called Marginal Revolution every day. It was actually co-written by Tyler Cowen and Alex Tabarrok at George Mason. I think Tyler Cowen is the most influential living economist. I think he's maybe the most important public intellectual in America today. He does a podcast series. He has his blog. He writes books. He has a whole course of economics that you can take online. He is beyond a polymath and just brilliant. He also just released his book called Stubborn Attachments, which is his statement of his philosophy. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Well, I think their support of my silly game addictions and their encouragement for me to believe that things are possible has been the thing that stuck with me the longest. All right. Last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? <laughs> Boy, that's a tough one. I don't have any uniquely brilliant things, but I try to make the most of every day. Like I'm back here in New York. I lived here in New York for multiple years. Sometimes I didn't appreciate how good things were then and try to make sure that I don't make that mistake now. I'm very much enjoying my life now. I'm loving working on this project, whether I have an impact or not. And who knows, this might be a very foolish lesson that some hedge fund guy goes to Washington and thinks he's going to change things. Who knows if that's you know, really a good idea or a really bad one. I don't know, but I'm enjoying it and I'm trying to make sure I'm in the moment. And if I prove to have wasted some of my time and some of my money doing this, if I enjoy the effort, then it's not such a waste. I believe immigration reform in a big way can happen this year, and I'm just going to enjoy trying to be part of that. Great. Steve, thanks so much. Thank you, Ted. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. Oh, 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 oh